I'm Warwick, and I'm one of the pastors here. If you're watching online, if you're in Platinum, it's great to have you here. We're really, really pleased. Um, we're trying a new setup. See what you think. Give us your feedback. Um, I think we get about 50 or 60 more people in, and everybody gets more legroom. That's got to be good. Okay. We all know, don't we, that Dubai attracts A-type personalities, entrepreneurs, and the go-getters. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that if you have made Dubai home, that's you. Now, now you might be thinking, oh, hang on, I've met plenty of go-getters in my time, but I don't put myself in that category. Uh, Think again. You've all got up and gone already. Your friends and family at home, they know that you're a go-getter because you've done what they haven't. You've taken the risk. They never did. You're here and they're not. You're living in the fast lane. Now, like most of us, you arrived with a plan or at least a wish. We all came looking forward to what might happen. And if you're like the rest of us, the longer you've been here, the more you've realised that no matter how much of an entrepreneur you are, no matter how much you've got up and gone, if you'd known the future, if you'd known what was going to happen, you'd have made different choices. You'd have made wiser decisions. There would have been times when you said no rather than yes, when you'd left early rather than stay, when you'd saved rather than spent. If if we held the future in our hands, we'd all live very different lives. If we knew what was going to take place, we'd all make different choices. We wouldn't be paralysed by indecision. We'd stop trying to read the tea leaves and we'd give up trying to second guess what God wants us to do with our lives. See, if we knew the future, it would profoundly impact how we lived now. This morning, I want us to discover two things. Firstly, that God has given us a very clear picture of the future. And secondly, he expects this knowledge of the future to shape you and me as gospel entrepreneurs, as gospel go-getters. How about we pray and ask God to speak to us through his word this morning? Would you pray with me? Let me pray. Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we do pray that as we look at your word, you would make the future clear to us. Help us to understand what you have in store and help us to live our lives now with the future shaping them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's an outline on the screen uh, behind me of where we're going this morning. Uh, It'll keep popping up uh, as we go through so you can follow where we are. We're going to be looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. It's written by Paul, who's one of the early leaders of the Christian church. And he's writing to his friends in the Macedonian city of Thessalonica. And right from the outset, Paul gets the Thessalonians to look back. And he does it by reminding them about what God has done for them in their lives. He writes in chapter 1, verse 3, he says this, We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so. Why? Because your faith is growing more and more. Not only that, but also the love all of you have for one another is increasing. Now, Our English Bibles at this point struggle to describe the explosive nature of that growth. When he says more and more, uh, the word is much more like popcorn. Uh, You know that, you know, it's like when you put popcorn in the microwave, you put it in, hit the buttons, tick, 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 and it goes, and then all of a sudden, and it just takes off. That's what's happening with the Thessalonians' faith in God. Their faith is growing so fast, it's like it's exploding. Just like their love that each of them has, one for the other. And their recent growth is so startling, so incredible, that Paul has been telling the other believers in the other churches just how amazing God's work in the Thessalonians has been. Look at what he says in verse 4. He says, Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you're enduring. Not only is their faith and love exploding, it's exploding in the middle of the Thessalonians being persecuted. Just when you think their faith and love would be extinguished by persecution, 
exactly the opposite happened, which explains Paul's boasting, his excitement. You see, these changes in the Thessalonians' lives, they're not signs that the Thessalonians are super Christians. Right? Rather, they are signs that God is at work in an extraordinary way in these men and women. Paul is boasting in God. Paul is boasting in God in what he's done in and for and through them. That's what Jim did last week when he got us to get on the fellowship bus and have a look back at what has happened in the last 12 months. Look back at what God has done in and through and for us. He reminded us of the extraordinary changes in the young adults ministry, the way that the number of 242 group leaders has just exploded, about the the number of people who have been trained for ministry through Equip for Life. He showed us what God's doing in our kids' ministry through the brilliant leaders that he's raised up, men like Jim Jose who have started our new tweens ministry, or then all of those people, men and women, who God has saved and have been baptised in the last 12 months. It's... It's just extraordinary what God has done. Brothers and sisters, looking back is vital because when we do, just like Paul did, we see very clearly the hand of God at work. Looking back helps us to appreciate the reason why Paul is so certain about the future. That is, what God has done in the past in the lives of the Thessalonians is their guarantee, is the source of their certainty for what God will do in the future. If he's done this in the past, he'll certainly deliver all that he's promised in the future. So why don't we have a quick look into the future? Have a look at verse 6 with me. The first three words of verse 6 are ominous. God is just. And the words that follow are, quite frankly, unsettling at best. They are rightly terrifying and incredibly sobering. Now, as I read them, I want you to notice a couple of things. There is no vitriol. There is no pulpit thumping. There's no celebration. There is no joy in what will happen to those who refuse Jesus. As I read the words, I want you to remember the cross. I want you to remember that Jesus died for his enemies for us so that you and I could be reconciled with him. I want you to remember it because he died because he loved his enemies. He loved us. He loved to forgive his enemies. And you and I, we follow him, which means we love our enemies. We forgive our enemies. The last thing we want for anyone, our enemies included, is that they would get what they deserve. You and I, we've been given grace. We want everybody to taste the same grace that has shaped us. But I also want you to see the future. I want you to see the certainty of the future, that there is a time coming When the time for forgiveness is gone. When there will be no possibility of forgiveness. When the judgment that Jesus took on himself for us is poured out on all of those who refuse his offer. Who turn their backs on his sacrifice for them. God is just. He will give them what they deserve. God is just. He will give them what they wanted. He will honour their choice. In life, if they wanted nothing to do with him, in eternity, he will have nothing to do with them. It'll be horrific. Have a look at what he says. We read in red, he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. What will that trouble be like? Well, look at verse 8. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the future. That's the facts. And when he says who do not know God, he, he means those who refuse to know God, 
refuse to know God as he is, who don't want to know, who prefer alternative facts, who have their own ideas, who, who want to decide for themselves what is true and what isn't, who decide that Jesus isn't worth following or that their view of Jesus trumps what God thinks about Jesus. What will happen to them? Have a look at what he says. They'll be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Now, if you're thinking, what about those who have never heard, who know nothing about Jesus? Remember with me verse 6. God is just. And Romans 2 makes it absolutely clear that God will only ever judge us based on what we know and not what we don't know. The problem everyone in this room has is this. If you are not yet a follower of Jesus, you know enough. Not only do you know enough, but you have plenty of opportunity to find out more. If we turn our backs... On what we know, if we won't or don't find out the truth about Jesus and follow him, there is no hope for us on the day of judgment. Whereas if we take Jesus seriously, if we follow him as he is, then verse 7, our future will be very different. Like the Thessalonians, he will give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. Verse 9 We won't be shut out of the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. We'll be right there with him. Right there with him on the day when he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. And this includes you because you believed our testimony to you. Friends, it's going to be good. Really good to be gathered around the throne with Jesus for eternity. There is a certain future and there are only two options. The question is, as it now stands right now, what is your future looking like? The good news is it's not too late. It's not too late for anyone to come to Jesus and to ask him for forgiveness. If you've never done that, remember this. Jesus died for you. That's how much he wants to be reconciled to you. He took the punishment that you and I justly deserve. If you would like a different future to the one you know you now have, do something about it today. Come and grab Tim. Come and grab me. I'll be by the lifts over there. The the prayer team will be down the front. We would love to show you just how simple it is to ask for forgiveness and for Jesus to give you a certain future with him. Don't put it off. Do something about it today. That's the future. And it absolutely shapes... Point four, how we live now in the present. Have a look at verse 11 and see the way that Paul prays for the Thessalonians. He longs for for God to do something in them now. He says this. He prays, with this in mind, that is with the certainty of the judgment to come, with the certainty of you guys spending eternity with Jesus, with this in mind, we constantly pray for you. And we ask God to do two things. Firstly, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling, which we'll see in a moment has got absolutely nothing to do with any ministry that you might do and everything to do with the way that God has saved them. But notice that he doesn't ask them to make themselves worthy of his calling. He's not asking them to pick them up by their bootstraps. He's not asking them to change and transform themselves. When he prays, he's asking God to do something for them and in them to keep transforming them, as we saw he's already done. He's actually asking God to keep it going. Have a look at the way he puts it in the next chapter, in chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. He says, But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by God. Why? Because of what God's already done in you. 
because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved, because you're among some of the first ever to be saved through Christ's death. And how did he do it? What well, says here in the passage, through sanctification by the Spirit. That is, he's made you holy by his Spirit. And how did that happen? Well, he says it, through belief in the truth. Notice verse 14. He explains what he means by their calling. He says, to this, that is holiness, he's called you. How? Through the gospel. Why? So that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Christian's calling, God's calling to them, is to believe in Jesus, to put their faith in Jesus. And when they put their trust in his death, the reason is so that they would be holy, so that they would obtain his glory. That is, so that they would become just like him. So that we might become just like Jesus. So think about it. Who is Jesus? He's God's son. A son who knows his father's mind and plans and pleases him in every way. Galatians 4 puts this sonship idea just beautifully. Paul writes this. He says, And because you're sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you're no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Now, ladies, don't feel left out. All right, he says, sons... All right, And that's because in the first century, only sons inherited. Only sons had the full rights. So you ladies, you're sons. Woohoo! It's kind of cool. We are, he said, just like Jesus. We're sons like Jesus. We think like Jesus. We feel like Jesus. We act like Jesus. That is, as sons, we understand our Father. We know his plans and purposes, and they become ours. But when God makes us worthy of his calling, we're sons, not slaves. You see, slaves, they don't love their masters. They, don't, they just wait for orders, and they do what they're told. Sons know their fathers, love their fathers, and understand the family business and take ownership of it. My dad's 85. I was going to say he's getting old, but he's actually all old already. Uh, his memory is not what it used to be. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, he had his hip replaced. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been having some of those father-son chats that only fathers and sons can have. Now, he loves, that's my mum, he loves my mum to bits. But he also knows that the time is coming when he's not going to be able to care for her as he would like to. So after the last couple of weeks, we've had some of those conversations that only fathers and sons can have, where I've said to him, Dad, when you're ready, let me help. I know you, and I know you want mum cared for. I'll do it just the way you want it done. It was a conversation that my dad could never have with the gardener or the cleaner. It's a conversation only a son could have. When God makes us worthy of his calling to be sons, he makes us just like his son Jesus in everything, in character, in understanding and in purpose. That is, when we are made his sons, we know our father and we understand what he is doing in his world. Which brings us to his second request, which is intimately tied to the first. A request that God would make us gospel entrepreneurs. Have a look at verse 11. He says, With this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling, and secondly, that by his power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. Now, I'm not sure if you understand just how extraordinary that request is. He prays that by his power, that is, God would put his muscle behind every good idea that you and I have that spring from our understanding of Jesus' death and that God would make them happen. 
He doesn't pray like so many people do today. God, show me your will. Show me which way to turn. Show me what decision to make. He doesn't pray like that at all. Paul prays with the confidence of a son rather than with the servitude of a slave. Paul prays as a son who knows his father, not as a slave who is waiting for orders. Paul prays as a son when he prays for his fellow sons who God is making worthy to be sons. Sons who know their father's mind, know their father's heart, who understand their father's plans for the future. And he prays that God, by his power, would get behind your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. That is, God, put your muscle behind every good idea that the Thessalonians have to serve you as father and to grow your kingdom. Every desire to see others served and loved. Every deed that springs from your understanding about what God is doing in the world and the future that is coming. He doesn't pray that they would discover God's will and do it. He expects them to have been so changed by God that already they think like their father, they feel like their father, and they long for the same things as their father. And he prays that God would get behind those ideas and serve their father. Brothers and sisters, this is liberating. So many believers today are hamstrung and paralysed into inaction because they can't seem to work out what God wants them to do, what decision to make, what exactly is the right thing. Let me be absolutely clear. There is no promise anywhere in the New Testament that God would reveal any more of his plans to us than he has already done in the Scriptures. In fact, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, we read this. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Now, get your mouth ready. I need an answer. Okay, you ready? Quick question. If we have everything we need for life and godliness, do we need anything else? No, no, no. (laughs) If we have everything we need for life and godliness, do we need anything else? No. No. Do we need a word from God before we act? Do we need a word of God before we act? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because we have everything we need for life and godliness already. How did we get it? Look at what he says. Through our knowledge of him who called you by his own glory and goodness. Through the scriptures. Paul doesn't pray that the Thessalonians would discover God's specific will. He asks God to get behind any idea, every idea they have, and make them happen. And he prays that because God has already given them everything that they need to know for life and godliness. Everything they need to know to make godly plans and decisions in the light of a certain future. They need nothing else other than his power behind their ideas to bring them to fruition. This is the entrepreneur's prayer. Entrepreneurs are go-getters. They get up and get going. This is our prayer, the fellowship's prayer. Think about it. 13 years ago, seven families got together to read Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren, a book that helped them to understand the future and what God has said he is doing in this world, that God would judge all people. And based on their understanding of the Scriptures... They looked around Dubai, they saw their neighbours, friends and colleagues and realised that an enormous number of them didn't know Jesus and were lost, so they had an idea for goodness, a deed prompted by their faith. They decided to start a church that would have as its goal reaching those who don't know Jesus. They wanted to create a church for people who think they don't like church, so they could introduce their friends and colleagues to a God they think they don't need, So they could come to faith in Jesus, be discipled and equipped and sent back to their home countries carrying the gospel. 
they prayed the entrepreneur's prayer and God put his considerable muscle behind their ideas prompted by their faith. And look at what God has grown. We've turned you through 90 degrees today so we could fit 50 to 60 more people in the room. It's brilliant. But they didn't know that this was what God had planned. This was never in their minds. They never dreamt of this. But God took their good ideas that they had because they were sons, because they knew the Father's heart for the lost and they understood the Father's plans for judgment. They acted on what they knew as go-getters and their father put his muscle, his power behind everything they did. And how grateful to God are we for that? How good is this? They got up and went and we benefit. And we glorify God for it. Which brings us to the two reasons that Paul prayed. Check out verse 12. Just as we give thanks to God for what he did through these seven families. So Paul writes, we pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him. We pray reason one. We ask God to put his muscle behind your good ideas so that Jesus would be glorified. Please, God, make our crazy plans come to life so that when it happens, you would get the glory. Now, as much as we love Pastor Jim, how many of you love Jim? Just a quick show of hands. And there's the rest of you, that's okay. We're not fellowship. We're... Fellowship isn't what it is because we have the best senior pastor in the world. Jim will tell you that the growth has been in spite of him. It's because of God's power behind the good ideas that have sprung from his people, from their understanding of the faith. God's muscle has made it happen. God gets the glory. We're gospel entrepreneurs as a people. That's who we are as a fellowship. But it's God who is glorified through what he does. Reason one, we pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you. And reason two, it's kind of cute, and you in him. That is, as God puts his muscle behind us, he powers our good intentions. What happens? We get changed. We get transformed so that we are more like Jesus. And as we get changed to be more like Jesus, who gets the glory? Jesus does. Takes us back to reason one. As we're transformed, he's glorified again. Friends, we live in the fast lane. We're gospel go-getters. We're gospel entrepreneurs. We can look back and see what God has already done in us and through us and for us. And we know God's promised future. And as we look around our city, we can see opportunities everywhere. Opportunities that you and I individually and corporately need to be asking God to put his muscle behind Because you and I, we don't want to see anybody on the wrong side of Judgment Day. Which is why, as a fellowship, we make all sorts of plans and we pray like gospel entrepreneurs. Just think about some of our plans. We've got Movement Day coming up in a couple of weeks. The Redeemers, the, the, the leaders at Redeemer Church in New York, Tim Keller and his guys, they saw what happened when they gathered men and women from all over their city, churches all over their city, And gave them the opportunity to dream, to think creatively, to plan collaboratively, to pull their resources and to ask God to put his muscle behind the good ideas that came out of Movement Day. And the changes that they've seen in New York, they want to see happen in cities all around the world. So they've come to us and said, let us help you act as gospel entrepreneurs And let's see what God will do when he unleashes his muscle in your city as well. So if you're not working on March the 16th, plan to be in this room as a gospel go-getter, as a gospel entrepreneur. Plan to be here. Plan to dream with others and pray with others and, and ask God to get behind the good ideas that get crafted on that day. Plan to be part of what God is doing next in our city as he seeks to save the lost before the day of Christ. And start praying that God would be at work in those who are coming, sparking their imaginations, reminding them of a certain future, causing them to have an urgency 
because we know that future is closer every single day. One of the other plans we've got, well, the elders have uh, put together a group they're calling the Fellowship of the Future. Because the, the elders have worked out that now is actually the time to act. This is a group of entrepreneurs within our congregation who have been asked to dream big. You know, it's the year of tolerance, next year's 2020. Dubai, well, the, the eyes of the world are on Dubai. We're asking this group to think with gospel-shaped hearts and minds about what they can ask the government to do for us. We're running out of space. At Creekside, we're putting out new chairs every week. Two seasons, we're turning you around and we're trying to fit more people in and we've actually had to turn people away. We've been that full. We don't have a home. We're thinking through how we can ask the government for maybe some space, a possibility of a third site or a fourth site or a fifth site that we can meet in, land for a compound, spaces for other churches to meet in. We're keenly aware that unless God puts his muscle behind our good ideas, they will never see the light of day. So let me ask you to please pray for the fellowship of the future as they meet. Ask God to use their ideas and put his might behind them so that as these plans go from idea to reality, God would be glorified and lives would be transformed. Another example of entrepreneurial thinking is this. About 12 months ago, some of the elders asked a series of awkward questions of the pastors. They asked, what does a mature believer look like? What does growth in maturity look like and, and how does it happen? Those questions got the pastors thinking really hard and they've come up with a really cool tool. It's called the gospel grid or the growth grid. And over the next couple of months, we're going to be rolling out the growth grid to all of our ministries and to the congregation. It's an idea that sprung from our understanding of the gospel and we're asking God to put his muscle behind it because we know that when he does, he will grow us as a community to maturity in Christ. Not only that, but the gospel will spread even more effectively from Dubai to the world and will bring him significant glory. You'll see what we've talked about in here. Take it home and read it. This is, this is gospel entrepreneurship, just on paper. Pray about it. Think about it. Now, if you're thinking, hang on, this seems like it's all about church stuff, and I'm, I'm just a punter in the pew, right? I'm, I'm not a, you know, one of those fellowship of the future gospel entrepreneur. I'm just me, right? I want you to notice this. Paul's prayer is for all of us as individuals. It's for us as individuals, not just for the church as a whole. It's first and foremost a prayer for the individuals within the church. That God would take your good ideas and your good ideas and your good ideas... Not just the big ones. Right? It doesn't have to be, you know, how do we save blah. It can just be a medium-sized one or just a small one in the corner. Let me show you a small one in the corner with you. Uh, my wife, Kaz, has been uh, in Australia uh, visiting the grandchild. Please notice the restraint. No photo of grandchild for you today. Uh, and she's been away for two weeks. Now, we read the Bible together each morning. I sit on one side of the table. She sits on the other side of the table. And we don't talk to each other. Um, but we read the same passage and we encourage one another. Uh, we got to the end of Joshua and Kaz sent me a message while she was away. Joshua's finished, what's next? And, and I looked at the list of things that we hadn't read on the Explore app that we're using and I noticed that we hadn't read Song of Songs. I'm missing my wife. <laughs> and I had a good idea that was you know, sprung from a faith. And I said, honey, how about we read Song of Songs together? Let me tell you, the last week or so has been, it's been exciting. <laughs> oh, the messages that have been going backwards and forwards to one another, it's been lovely. But, but more than that, as we've read Song of Songs together, God has put his muscle behind that just simple idea and changed us. I've been, well... I love my wife dearly. Song of Songs reminded me about so many reasons why I love her so much. But as we read the Bible together, it reminded me that that's just a picture of how much God loves us. And it's warmed my heart towards my Saviour in ways that I never thought would happen. God took our idea, put his muscle behind it, and made it something more than it would have been if it was just me. What are your good ideas? What do you long to see happen? 
the little things, the medium-sized things, the big things in your family, in your workplace? What do you long to see happen with the light of the second coming, with the light of judgment? What do you want to see happen? Over the next four weeks, we're going to be running a series called The Conversation. And we're going to train you in church on a Friday how to have the conversation, how to be gospel entrepreneurs with your words and begin to speak in ways that you didn't think were possible about the judgment to come, about the grace of God and about how lives can be transformed. That's another good idea that we've got that's sprung from our faith and we're asking God to put his muscle behind. What are yours? I'm going to ask the band to come up. I'm going to pray and uh, we're going to sing our last song. Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would give us good ideas, that as sons we would understand your plans and purposes, your heart and mind, and that we would long as sons to work at the things that you're working at. Father, we pray that you would put our muscle behind, your muscle rather, behind those good ideas and transform those around about us. Bring them into the kingdom and grow them more and more into the image of your son as you're doing with us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.